So I think the uh, biological part of snow bolith is going to get very interesting. And uh, the reasons are that it is looking um, as if, fr from biomarker studies, there is a major shift in the primary producers among eukaryotes, that is algae in the ocean that coincides with the cryogenian glaciations, a shift from a dominance of red algae to a dominance of green algae. And it's seen very clearly in a small number of uh, sections where biomarkers in bitumens are sufficiently well preserved to be studied by careful workers who are working uh, under strict protocols to, uh, uh, to discriminate uh, contaminants. Uh, from molecular clock studies, it now appears that many of the most important groups of planktonic marine cyanobacteria, including the major nitrogen fixers and the picocyanobacteria, like Prochlorococcus, which are the most abundant ones in the mixed layer of the open ocean, that they have a last common ancestor in cryogenian time within the crude estimates of these molecular clock timings, and that their ancestors were of freshwater origin. So a freshwater clade of cyanobacteria took over the ocean and dominated the ocean until today, and that that occurred in the, in, in the, in the cryogenian. And that it is possible that the rise of oxygen which people have been talking about for a long time, the second rise of oxygen, not the great oxidation event around 2.4, but the second one that occurred sometime in the late Neoproterozoic, early Paleozoic, might actually have been a consequence of snowball glaciation, uh, allowing the ascendancy of uh, large active and, uh, and uh, 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 multicellular animals uh, is also tied into these events. Okay. But uh, I would say up until now, uh, although biologists have been somewhat interested in this, paleontologists have been on the whole uh, fairly resistant to, to the idea and, and have expressed the opinion that they would prefer solutions where there's open water. And the reasons are obvious because uh, it is a challenge uh, for primary production and complex organisms if the ocean is covered by uh, the ice that's hundreds and hundreds of meters thick everywhere. And continental surface temperatures are below freezing everywhere. Okay. So here are the data for metazoa. Uh, I think most biologists will tell you that none of the purported multicellular animal macrofossils is convincing. That is, before the Ediacaran. And in fact, the oldest really convincing sponge is from the Doshantro phosphorite of uncertain age, but maybe in the 580 to 620 range, uh, is really convincing, but it's one specimen of a microfossil. However, uh, there is this, uh, there are biomarkers from Gordon Love and Associates of uh, the sponge biomarker 24 isopropyl cholestane, which although it has had challenges, still appears to be a robust biomarker for sponges, including the most primitive sponges, demo sponges, back to either within or just before the Maranoan glaciation in the South Oman salt basin in the Arab Arabian Peninsula in Oman. Gordon Love at um, University of California, Riverside. Uh, that was published in Nature in 2009. Uh, these are molecular clock estimates, uh, mostly from uh, Kevin Peterson, from a pretty sophisticated concatenated molecular clock calibrated by invertebrates, which is much better, uh, gives uh, estimates that are more geologically reasonable. Uh, for metazoa. So here are the existing metazoan uh, clades, and uh, these are estimates of the last, uh, uh, the first appearances of crown group, uh, crown group phyla, that is phyla, they're still alive today. So you can see that uh, some of the important last common ancestors 
uh, are predicted to have had crown groups, that is clades that uh, still live, live on today, are expressed in, in, in modern organisms that are back in the cryogenium. So even if you dismiss the macrofossil evidence for pre-Ediacaran multicellular animals, uh, it is sort of predicted from molecular clock data and supported by this biomarker data that metazoans arose during the cryogenium or before. Now this is a summary slide from uh, Andy Knoll, taken from a number of different uh, co-authors, of eukaryotic fossils that predate the Sturdian glaciation. And these are examples of crown groups. This is a stem group, so these survived. And these include green algae. Okay, these are from the Svanberg Fjellet in Svalbard. Uh, these are testate amoebae. These are single-celled animals, protists, that produce a wide diversity of uh, uh, little shells like that, remarkably similar to modern form. forms. They've been studied mainly by Susanna Porter at uh, UC Santa Barbara. And these are from the Chuar group, which is about 740 MA. And these are the multicellular red algae uh, that were described by uh, Nick Butterfield, who also described these, but this from the hunting formation in Arctic Canada. Uh, these are the ages here. These are the, the exquisitely preserved in phosphorite scale microfossils of unknown uh, phylogenetic affinity, really, from the 15 mile group around 800, 1800 million years, uh, described by Phoebe Cohen. These are the oldest skeletal organisms. And they're incredibly diverse and disparate. Almost every shape is present. Um, and fantastic three dimensional preservation. Uh, it is an assemblage that is known from one bed at one location. Now, uh, this apparent increase in diversity um, in the pre Sturdian, that is between about 800 and uh, 720, the Sturdian glaciation is referred to widely in the paleontological and biological literature as a diversification event, a major diversification event of eukaryotic organisms. However, uh, it is important to remember, and this is work by Phoebe Cohen that came out uh, last year, that when you look at the within assemblage diversity, that's diversity within a given fossil assemblage, this increase in overall diversity is essentially driven by three assemblages only in, uh, in say, a billion years of time. So Mesoproterozoic, um, Pre-Sturdian, Cryogenian, Ediacaran. And these are just uh, different assemblages uh, organized by the microfossil type. And, the, and uh, uh, these are of all euc uh, eukaryotes, but not metazoans. And they're just organized in re according to relative age. Okay. And you can see that the diversity is really only three assemblages over a very long time period. Okay. So be careful. You know, I, I think maybe people are making a little bit too much of this dis diversification event uh, considering the small number. But nevertheless, uh, the important thing is that you have green algae that look like they're ancestral to modern green algae, red algae look like they're, modern, they're ancestral, that predate the cryogenian and therefore had to survive. Okay. Uh, these also, these uh, may, may have gone extinct. Do you know what those uh, tests are made out of? Uh, phosphate. Phosphate and the green algae one? Um, those are just organic compressions. Okay. Yeah. So these are just two dimensional preservation. That's actually in chert. Um, uh, but it, it's just, you know, organic pigment, I guess. So that's just an organic yeah. Yeah. But these are skeletal. These are skeletal. So they're in phosphorite, so you just dissolve out the phosphorite. Uh, or, sorry, they're in limestone, limestone or dolomite, so you just dissolve out the carbonate, and the phosphorite is, phosphate is a re in the residue. Okay. Yeah. The same with the Dochantuo uh, um, phosphorite deposit. Okay, so, so there, are two, there are two questions here. First of all, uh, how did organisms, particularly phototrophs, which need sunlight, uh, or heterotrophs also, because they need pr primary pr production to live on, 
uh, how did they survive, number one, and how did things evolve? Because it looks like there were major changes. So from the biomarker standpoint, it looks like although red and green algae both existed, in terms of their importance in primary production, it looked like you had mostly red algae dominated biomarkers before and green algae dominated biomarkers afterwards. So there's a major switch. So, you know, and, and, and metazoa, it looks at least from the molecular clocks, like, you know, things were really, there was a radiation at that time. So A, there's two problems, you know, survival and evolution. How did it occur? And remember the time scale. So everything is frozen, but it's important to remember that anything that's on the surface here gets, gets, gets buried here and then exposed here. Okay. So uh, the first thing I thought about is if you're looking for a place for, for organisms to survive were, were crack systems. Because wherever you have floating ice next to grounded ice, uh, you're going to have shear, and you develop cracks like that. So in the cracks, although they will get frozen over very quickly because the air temperature is so cold, it'll still be like new sea ice. And new sea ice is full of brine channels. It's got lots of eukaryotic organisms as well as cyanobacteria. So that, that could be a potential habitat. The problem is that the ice is so thick that these cracks are really deep. So there's not very much sunlight down there. You have to have a crack that you know, happens to be oriented right in the ecliptic plane to have you know, any significant uh, light shining at the bottom of the crack because the crack's going to be 100 meters deep. <clears throat> but this, this was a game changer. This experiment that showed that the, the ice sheets are getting smaller, and so areas of bare land are always present, and, and they're getting bigger and bigger. So that means there's a lot of dust. Okay. And so there's interest then in looking at the areas where you have exposed ground today, uh, like the McMurdo Dry Valleys. So McMurdo Dry Valleys also produce dust, and uh, you can measure the dust in deep sea cores around Antarctica, and it, uh, it, it varies between a hundredth and a thousandth of a millimeter per year. It doesn't sound like very much, but it actually works out to between one and ten meters of dust per million years. And so you integrate that over 15 or 58 million years, that's a lot of dust. Even like that for all around Antarctica, and that's, that's, this is the only significant part of Antarctica uh, that, that is not ice covered. So there's been a lot of interest actually in, in uh, you know, who's living here. And it's not, you know, not just for snowball, but for exoplanets and stuff. This is one of the high uh, dry valleys. Turns out there's virtually nothing uh, life there. Uh, but down the lower elevations where the catabatic winds are a little bit warmer, uh, there, there, there are uh, bacteria, including cyanobacteria, living underneath rocks, particularly quartz, because sunlight gets through, and in cracks and, and, uh, and on crusts and stuff like that. Uh, no eukaryotes, though, only, only bacteria. Uh, similarly, uh, there's bacteria in the brine beneath some of these highly uh, su sublimative uh, and evaporative lakes. Okay, so this is Lake Vida in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. So the lake water is very saline. Uh, there's also dust within the ice, and so the dust has little films of meltwater at, the, at a certain depth below the surface, around a meter and a half. And there are bacteria that live uh, on that water, but no eukaryotes. Because remember, eukaryotes are enormous, the cell size relative to bacteria. Now, so here are eukaryotes. eukaryotes. These are green algae, the ones that take over uh, after the cryogenian. But this is on the West Antarctic Peninsula, uh, uh, and, and this is much warmer conditions, see the open water. So that's really not snowball. So these uh, snow algae, as they're called, uh, they, you see them in all polar glaciers, uh, but only where the surface temperatures reach the melting point at some time during the year. Okay, if, it, if it's below freezing all the time, then, uh, then you don't see them. Okay. So the first person to really... Uh, <laughs> get going on dust on ice was this interesting fellow here, uh, Adolf Eric Nordenschult, who uh, was uh, from a very famous uh, scientific family. He was born in Helsinki, uh, so that's why it's an I here rather than a J, which would be the Swedish spelling. He, as a young man, he had uh, um, 
position at the University of uh, Helsinki, but he got into trouble with the authorities for uh, expressing views in favor of Finnish independence from Russia during the uh, Crimean War of the 1850s. You know, <laughs> there's a long history of Crimea. And uh, so he had to get out of uh, uh, Finland. He went to, uh, uh, to Sweden. And he's most remembered as an Arctic explorer. So he, uh, in 19, uh, sorry, 1878, he made the first uh, uh, sailing of the Northeast Passage, that is the Arctic coast of Europe and Asia, from end to end in a circumnavigation of Asia in 1878. And that's what he's mostly remembered for. But eight years earlier, on the first of his two expeditions to West Greenland, he described and named something called cryokonite and cryokonite holes. So what Nordenshild tried to do was to uh, climb up the steep uh, slope of the Greenland ice sheet and get into the interior where he and most people at that time thought there would be a boreal forest. People th thought that the, the ice in Greenland was just in the mountain glaciers around the periphery. And if they could get into the interior, they'd find the forest. And uh, so we, he went up this glacier here. Here's the famous Jakobshaven uh, ice stream. So this is the ablative zone right here. And if, if you read his, uh, his diaries, he, he's complaining the whole time that the ablative zone is like hell because it just it littered with these pits that are about a half a meter deep and are filled with meltwater. And he said, there's no place to plant a boot, never mind a sleeping bag. Okay, because they're just everywhere. You can see the surface just completely. And, you're fine. and you know, if you're going up onto the Greenland ice cap, you don't want to have wet boots. And so this is a real problem. And the reason why they have meltwater is that there's a clump of dirt down on the bottom. And the dirt is dark because it's about 10 to 15 percent uh, extracellular polysaccharide from cyanobacterial production in the hole. And it's heavily pigmented because it gets a lot of sunlight in the summer when it's growing. And so this dark color uh, makes it warm, absorbs sunlight, and so it sinks down to an equilibrium depth in the ice. Can't sink any farther because it's because there's not enough light. And if it gets too shallow, then it'll sink down. So it reaches an equilibrium depth, which is around a half a meter. And it maintains, because of its dark color, maintains this, this meltwater. Okay? So there's lots of cyanobacterial production because you got sunlight and you got liquid water and you got nutrients, which is the you know, the 85 to 90 percent of the dirt that isn't organic matter, but which is mineral matter, dust, mineral dust. That provides the nutrients. So you have everything you need. And it turns out that cryokonite, so, so Nordenschild called it cryokonite, uh, simply meaning ice dust. And in, in English, he, he wrote in German, but in English, it's, it's, it's called, they're called cryokonite holes. And they occur on all, in the ablative zones of, of uh, of nearly all uh, glaciers and ice sheets on it. So here's an here's a equatorial one. And uh, they also occur on these Piedmont glaciers in the, in the Taylor Valley, where there's been quite a, a lot of, of study of them. So he, this, this was uh, um, uh, that um, Blood Falls here on the Taylor Glacier. That's Lake Vida. And uh, these Piedmont glaciers have, uh, so this is the Canada Glacier here. No, uh, uh, yeah, and so on Canada Glacier, here they are. And the same cryokonite holes again. And here's what they contain. And this is from uh, uh, both cellular and molecular uh, 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 analysis. So about 10% of the weight of the dust is cyanobacteria, mostly extracellular uh, mucilage. Uh, the eukaryotic algae are exclusively green algae. Oh, and incidentally, this same assemblage is, is in cryokonite holes at basically all latitudes. Of course, remember the low latitude ones are high up, so they're also cold. So they're very, there's a very sort of common assemblage here. So green algae, which remember is the algae that takes over after the cryogenia, fungi, ciliates, and, 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 which is a protist, okay, so our, so our single cell lamb, and three metazoans, nematodes, tardigrades, and rotifers. These are all uh, metazoans that have a, a special uh, enzymatic process that allows themselves to self-desiccate and extend extreme cold. These are late evolvers. I'm not going to try to tell you that uh, these metazone clades actually exist in the cryogenia, and I think that's highly unlikely. <clears throat> so here's how they work in, in the high latitudes, uh, say on, this is from uh, Taylor Glacier, over the seasonal cycle. So in the winter, uh, these holes freeze right to the bottom, okay, because it's so cold. 
But in, uh, in, uh, uh, as you go into the summer season, you start to get meltwater, and you start to get cyanobacterial activity, which is producing oxygen. So you get meltwater that grows, and you also get sublimation, ablation of the surface, and you get more and more air produced, very oxygen-rich air from, from photosynthesis. And then this thing then freezes back down again. And so this is sort of an annual, annual cycle. And this lid here is, is pretty clear ice it, it's because it's not compressed snow, unlike this, which is, which is significantly darker in the ablative zone because of uh, air bubbles. Now, there was a New Zealand guy working in Arctic Canada, Warwick Vincent, actually Vincent, because he's University of Montreal, I sometimes slip into the uh, uh, Francophone. Uh, who pointed out the potential for this for snowball Earth he was <coughs> studying uh, uh, an ice shelf uh, that's, that's quite far north. That's closer to the North Pole than uh, McMurdo is to the South Pole. And you can see these, uh, th these aren't just little holes. There are uh, large uh, expanses of, uh, of meltwater. Okay, and he suggested that uh, way back in uh, 2004, actually in 2000 first, but at that time, I thought all the snowball continents would be covered. And so I kind of dismissed the importance of, of dust. But these new model results have opened up the whole question of dust again. Okay, so I remember now the ablative zone in snowball Earth is at the equator, not at high latitude. And so at the equator, I would guess that these, these holes never freeze to the bottom. Okay, but there is a diurnal cycle rather than a seasonal cycle. So at the equator, seasonal cycle is very weak. It's also biannual. You have two summers, basically, at equinox, and the winters are at solstice. And, uh, but you have a strong diurnal cycle. So you get ice at night, but in the warmth of the afternoon, I, I suspect that ice disappears, and, and these holes are in direct uh, con uh, communication with the atmosphere. And notice that the whole time here from production, you're producing organic matter. So now on, on the modern world, where you have glaciers, when you're in the ablation zone, and these things only form in the ablation zone, because in the accumulation zone, of course, they're, they're continuously getting snow on them. And uh, so it's only, they only occur in the ablation zone. But in a modern glacier or, uh, or ice sheet, <clears throat> by the time you're in the ablation zone, uh, you, you can't survive there very long, because you're getting dumped off the, uh, at the end of the glacier. Okay? But in snowball Earth, uh, oh, yeah, so here, for example, this is uh, 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 Canada Glacier in Taylor Valley, and this is the snout, this is the Lake F uh, Frixel, and you can see all the dust that's, that's uh, ablating out of the ice. There's lots of dust in that ice, but, you know, it, it's, uh, for, as a habitat, it's, it's a, it, a very transient one. But in the snowball earth, there, there is no ice margin for the sea glacier. And moreover, the sea glacier is collecting dice uh, ice over a huge area of accumulation, and it's, and it's transporting it uh, to the surface here. So essentially, the, uh, the rate of dust accumulation, you can multiply by four for the accumulation rate in the ablation zone, because a, it's a factor of four difference between the area of the ablation zone and the area of the rest of the world. Okay. And so that should mean that the snowball, uh, once the, glacier, the sea glacier is moving, should look more like this. Okay, and there's a sort of funky depiction of, uh, of, of, of cryogenite, because at the rates of accumulation, remember those Antarctic rates of a hundredth to a thousandth of a millimeter per year, and how that's one to ten meters per million years? That's going to completely saturate the surface. So it's not just going to be little clumps of dust and holes. That, that, that dust is going to fill the surface. And so it's not going to be little holes. It's going to be ponds. Of, uh, and so one question is, well, why? If, the, if this is accumulating like that, why doesn't that just melt right through the ice and kill the snowball? How could a snowball ever last for 58 million years if you have this big dust accumulation, which is warming the ice because, because it's dark. And it's dark mainly because of this, these cyanobacteria, these heavily pigmented cyanobacteria. And you see why they want to be so heavily pigmented. I mean, the ocean they're living in is half a meter deep, and it's at the equator, so very bright sunlight. Okay, so the reason, I think, is that there's a feedback. And 
The more dust you accumulate, the more meltwater you produce, and that meltwater has to go somewhere. And if it drains somewhere, then it's going to cleanse the surface of dust. Okay, so if dust, in, if dust flux increases, meltwater production rate increases, and so the cleaning of the surface increases. Okay, and that sort of acts as a stabilizing feedback. If the dust flux wanes, then of course the dust will accumulate to make the surface darker. So you could have a negative feedback that stabilizes a dark area at the equator, but is insufficient to trigger deglaciation. Okay, and so here's what happens. This is on a modern ice shelf, obviously, in, uh, off the north coast of Greenland. And so these little ponds or pans here, they get connected by drainage systems, and, and they flush through these moulins. Okay, you don't want to fall in here because you're, you're going down. And so this meltwater is being flushed right through the, you know, the kilometer thick ice. The falling water has got enough latent heat to keep the crack open. And you know, people climb down into these things. So you can call them uh, 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 cryogenite meltwater flushing conduits. Or, so so here's, here's what I imagine is going on. So here's the cryogenite, this dark ice in the equatorial zone. Uh, and these are these flushing conduits. And so that uh, can maintain the situation because of this feedback between the meltwater production and the, and, the, and the albedo here because of the cleaning effect. Now, remember that the cryogenite is 10% organic matter. Okay? And um, the ocean uh, is anoxic, so there's no oxic uh, resp aerobic respiration. There's probably some anaerobic respiration, but that depends on the supply of sulfate and ferric iron, which is going to be in limited supply in the, in the snowball world. So I would expect that the anaerobic respiration is not going to be capable of respiring all this organic matter. And so even if the organic production and flushing rate is not that impressive by modern standards, I think there's a strong potential that the actual organic burial rate might be significant, especially when you're integrating it over such long periods. And uh, every molecule of organic matter that goes into sediment here is, is a molecule of O2 that's added to the atmosphere. So these are observations of the molybdenum, which is a redox metal, and, and vanadium shows about the same thing relative to organic matter. And uh, the, the larger the increase is more oxic conditions. And as you can see, there's a, uh, evidently a big in increase, an oxygenation event associated with the cryogenian. And these are the last common ancestors of some of the major uh, cyanobacterial planktonic uh, groups, including the major nitrogen fixers, which are, are these two. And these are non-nitrogen fixing uh, pico cyanobacterial bacteria. Uh, like chlorococcus, prochlorococcus, which is mo most abundant cyanobacteria uh, in the modern ocean. And they not only have last common ancestor uh, that's near the cryogenian, this is from molecular clock data, but their pre-cryogenian ancestry is as freshwater forms. They occur in freshwater assemblages, but not in marine assemblages. So it looks like the marine cyanobacteria before this time go extinct, and these freshwater ones take over. So guess why? You know, guess I think how that happened. You know, we the ocean has become this freshwater pond, you know, a meter or so deep, covering uh, about up to 60 million uh, square kilometers is the area of the ablative zone. Okay. Nick Butterfield says it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what, you know, remember it's small sample statistics, but it is, you're, you're very observant, exactly right, that there is a, uh, a low in diversity in the cryogenian uh, to such an extent that um, some authors actually just eliminate that period, uh, including a colleague of mine at Harvard. And, uh, <clears throat> but it is low, but there are only about four assemblages reported there, and they're all aquatarchs. 
and the member sedimentation rates are low. And of course, the, there's a positive feed when, you, when people report nothing, people don't go there. Um, uh, that has changed a little bit uh, through, due to the work of Tanya Bosak and Sarah Proust, and they've shown that actually there's a fair, you know, moderately diverse uh, protistin uh, uh, single-celled uh, uh, heterotroph uh, 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 flora, uh, particularly in the Sturdian cap. Is it the um, ice water melt in these sort of pockets that stops the water from becoming anoxic? Because I imagine if there's this sort of Oh, yeah. I, I think the cyanobacterial productivity um, uh, alone probably, well, okay, it's probably in steady state with respiration. So I think within the, within the, the whole of the pan itself, you'll have lots of aerobic respiration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the organic burial uh, in any permanent way would really only occur if it gets flushed. I, I presume that the ponds, you know, the superglacial environment is, it reaches a steady state. On the other hand, the, the atmospheric oxygen you would expect would be driven down uh, just from volcanic outgassing. So that must be a sink for some oxygen, and some weathering is also a sink. So you need it at some supply of oxygen just to maintain oxygen levels. We know we never went to extremely low oxygen levels in, this, in the cryogenic atmosphere, or at least in the Maranoan, because we have that uh, O17 anomaly. If there was too little oxygen, you'd never, you wouldn't have that anomaly. Incidentally, the best estimate for that anomaly is 40,000 ppm of CO2. Okay, so that's the cyanobacteria. Um, oh yeah, so here's a new uh, redox proxy. It's pretty only one paper on it so far that I know by uh, Pogi von Strandmann, and uh, this is, a, this is a, uh, from shales. And selenium isotopes get lighter <clears throat> under more oxic conditions. So as you can see uh, here around the cryogenian, it looks like a sort of step function uh, towards lighter values. And it actually looks like it increases after the sturt, oh, sorry, after the sturt and then after the Maranoan. These reduced values in shales are mostly associated with the cap carbonate sequence. So they really, in time, would probably be more compressed down here. So they're really reflecting the snowball uh, redox, not the post, not the atmosphere, but the snowball seawater. And so there does, uh, it provides some support for an increase actually during the cryogenian. Although I think uh, the honest thing is that the redox proxy record is not highly enough resolved at present to, uh, to test uh, the hypothesis that the snowball itself was responsible for the oxygen rise. But at least it's an interesting postulate that uh, at multicellular animals, uh, are possible is because of the because of the snowball and uh, <clears throat> this is this diagram from uh, uh, from John Payne's work uh, showing organic organismic volume a volume of uh, uh, organisms uh, on a log scale uh, and and this is the th sort of three the, the canonical three stages in uh, in the oxygenation of the atmosphere from uh, close to zero to prevailing low uh, values in the Proterozoic and then high values here. Uh, I think it's not impossible that this is directly related uh, <coughs> to organic burial during the snowball earth. However, uh, uh, as, as much as I'm really uh, uh, optimistic about the biology, I think this uh, cyanobacterial story, which I only read a, night, uh, a day or so ago, uh, and I had not previously rec uh, well. When I first read, this is a paper about two or three years old now by Patricia Sanchez Baracaldo uh, at Bristol, and she's the one who did that molecular clock date on the cyanobacteria. And I remember that paper, but the statement that the ancestors for all modern, uh, these major clades of marine planktonic cyanobacteria, that their, <coughs> their pre cryogenic ancestor is fresh water only, it didn't mean anything to me then because I wasn't thinking about cryokinite. I've only think, been thinking about cryokinite since January this year. And so it's amazing how when you have a new idea, you have to actually go back and reread old stuff because you're, you're, you're a different person. I, mean, uh, you, I, can't, uh, yeah, I can't stress enough the, the, the power of uh, ideas. And, and I'm speaking as a lifetime field geologist. Okay. However, there's a paradox. So let's, let's end with a paradox. And the paradox is that early sponges uh, 
most evolutionary people interested in early animals will say, will tell you, have told me, that they are stenohaline, which means that they're intolerant of salinities much outside the range of normal seawater because they don't have a mechanism for regulating the salinity within their cells. That's what I've heard. And yet, the snowball earth is deeply schizohaline because the superglacial meltwater is nearly fresh and the snowball ocean is extremely saline. Okay. And, uh, and, and although you could have uh, intermediate salinities here, I would expect that these are environments where the salinity uh, has large temperature dependent variability. So it's not clear that this is a, a, very, um, um, uh, a very pleasant environment for, for sponges. Corals, cnidarians, and it's not quite so clear. Uh, there are freshwater sponges today, but that, that's a late adaptation, uh, the evolutionary people tell me. Okay. So um, I want to thank one person who really uh, was important in my education about snowball earth, and that's Dan Schrag, um, who's not a field geologist. He's a geochemical oceanographer. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, my involvement in this would never have uh, gotten to first base, as we call it in America, uh, with, without Dan. He's, uh, he really got me going on what, what little I know about stable isotopes and... Uh, and oceanography, all three types of oceanography, chemical, biological, and, uh, and dynamical. And uh, so I owe an enormous debt to him. These are the, uh, my, my funding sources. Uh, I'm self-funded now. I do not take uh, government grants uh, since I retired. That's for younger people. <coughs> and uh, these people in particular have been uh, uh, very welcoming and friendly. Okay, so I do have the little dessert if you're if you're up, up for it. But that's my story about, I think, one of the great stories of uh, of geology. The power of geology is to is to amaze and attract attention uh, by all of the other sciences, biology and chemistry and physics, and and uh, I think here's an example that uh, that this power lives on. And this is not the last amazing thing that's going to come out of the out of the Proterozoic uh, record. Okay, so thanks all you all for, for, uh, for sticking with me. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Would you draw any conclusions from these studies into the possibility of primitive life on the same Mars? You know, I kind of take the view that if the ALH uh, 2000, whatever it was, meteorite can get from Mars to Earth without ever having been internally heated above, what, 80 degrees or something, Ben Weiss's work, um, we're all the same. We could have come from Mars. I think the inner solar system should all be interinoculated. So to go to Mars to look for ancient life, we're, if, if we found anything, my guess it'll be, it'll be just like here from a genetic standpoint. And the whole rationale was to find life that had a different point of origin from Earth. So, I, I, I mean, I love going to Mars because I think that Mars has a very interesting and, and uh, problematic uh, history in many ways. And I'm thrilled that they went to Gale Crater because that has the history book. But uh, the life part of it strikes me as just another fossil hunt. Yeah. Um, but with these plumes uh, of the equator reaching, the, um, reaching into the uh, water underneath the ice, yeah. would that be um, organic rich enough to form any shales at all? Or would there be maybe bacteria feeding on this? Kind of oh, we we talking about plumes in the atmosphere or in the ocean? In the ocean. Oh, okay. The, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there's going to be chemoautotrophs. Mm -hmm. uh, they should survive, although they will be challenged because um, 
uh, the salinity and the uh, redox gradients that they use will be reduced. Um, I guess the temperature gradients will be enhanced, but the redox gradients uh, and, and uh, the EH and pH gradients will be reduced. And uh, how much relevance do you think this sort of work has on Europa, for instance, where we have this? Sorry, the. Europa, we, Jupiter, one of Jupiter's moons, where they have the yeah. ice on the surface yeah. of the planet, but then there's evidence of a, a liquid water underneath. Yeah. Well, the evidence for liquid water in Europa comes from the magnetic field, which suggests there has to be a, a saline conductor at a depth of around 15 kilometers in the ice. Uh, the ice is dynamic on Europa, but for a completely different reason than on Earth. It, it's very, very thick. Um, it, it is heated by the eccentricity of the orbit. And so there's, a lot of def there's enough deformation uh, because of the eccentric orbit to actually create frictional heat. Uh, and so at some uh, depth, the, the ice at least is soft enough to, uh, uh, to flow. Uh, there, there's no plate tectonics, so there's no, there's, no re there's no way to build up CO2 and get out of the frozen state and, you know, until the sun blows up. <laughs> uh, so I, there's, I mean, Europe is really interesting, but it's not very analogous to, to Snowball Earth, either chemically or probably dynamically. Yeah. Uh, with regards to um, life being sustained through the cryogenic, uh, when you're talking about the um, temperatures, the factorial areas, you said the handling cells are reversed, so you've now got a high pressure system over the factorial area. Down flowing air, clear skies, light winds. Surely over land, there's a much better chance for much, much higher temperature for the strong yeah. equatorial sun. I think that's a very, very important point because I, don't, I think I took the slide out. But although there are um, cryokinite holes on those Piedmont glaciers in, in the McMurdo Dry Valleys, if you go up into the ablative zone in the Transantarctic Mountains closer to the South Pole, where it's a lot colder because it's higher, closer to the pole, there's no dust sticks at the surface there. You get these rocks, but no dust. It just re the winds just recycle it back to the fern. So uh, this looked like being a serious problem for the early stages of Snowball Earth uh, because the dust just wouldn't stick at, at those cold temperatures. And I think you're exactly right. Uh, the refugia, I mean, they're going to be hydrothermal refugia, but uh, the, the, the refugia of the cryokinite type is most probable at that time uh, in embayments in continental areas, particularly as it takes you know, quite a, a, a while, a few hundred thousand years, for the, for the ice to get thick enough to start to flow. So in the ablation zone, those continental areas will be, uh, be ice-free and they'll be relatively dark. And that, that lower albedo will make the surface temperatures much warmer and, and allow dust to stick. I, I think that's actually a very important part for the early stages of the snowball, which will be the most challenging for life. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Basically, as you have um, all of this very fresh uh, moraine and till being exposed, is there any indication or ideas of, about that um, when you have the deglaciation of, of the continents? Yeah, the, the, the only proxy record that I can think of that would, might be relevant to that would be the nitrogen isotope record, and the data are still very sparse. Uh, and the data we collected, actually from the plume fallout stuff, we were trying to actually measure the, uh, the nitrogen isotope composition of the ambient seawater, uh, hasn't been published yet, so I, I don't know Ben Johnson's latest thinking on that. Uh, so I really can't uh, answer that. I don't think there's uh, a clear record, but I don't, that it, it may be that record is there and just hasn't been uh, uh, investigated yet. You know. It looks like there's lots of organic productivity and, uh, and uh, burial. <laughs> okay, the dessert. So this is uh, this is tectonics. You know, I used to be a tech. Well, 
I'm a, I'm a, 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 a treacherous sedimentology that went into tectonics and then, uh, and then this stuff. Okay. But I, uh, I still follow uh, what's going on a little bit. So th th this is not my original work at all. This is just uh, my take on some uh, recent data. Now, the origin of Laurentia. This is what a single engine honor looked like. OK. So uh, interior Laurentia, as Ted Irving called it, consists of six or more Archean cratons that were formerly independent. And they assembled uh, sort of convulsively in Geon 19 and 18. So mainly between 1800 and uh, 2000 MA. And they're separated by uh, uh, paleoproterozoic orogenic belts of, of that age. Okay. And there's now paleomagnetic uh, evidence that's uh, increasingly supporting uh, this assembly of these uh, uh, cratons uh, due to the closure of intervening oceans. Okay. Now, uh, Going back to my old tectonics uh, days, you are always thinking about what's actually driving the plates. It's interesting that during the plate tectonic revolution, this was a kinematic revolution, not a dynamic revolution. There were very, very few papers, actually, about what actually causes the plates to move. Lots of papers are analyzing their relative motions. Uh, there was uh, a very influential uh, paper by Forsyth and Uyeda. I think it was published in 1974 and a follow-up by Chaplin and Tullis. And they showed that if you look at the modern plates, uh, they're, they're either going fast or they're hardly moving at all. And the ones that are going fast uh, are, are all have long trench lengths on their margin. And the motions look, in a mantle reference frame, look like they were moving towards those subduction zones. So th that led to the idea that plates are moving mostly because of buoyancy forces. Okay, they're sliding back into the mantle because they're denser than un the underlying mantle. And so it's basically a gravitational phenomenon. But there was, an, there was another uh, theory uh, that, w that was uh, uh, supported by uh, my uh, late colleague Rick O'Connell and his student Brad Hager. And he said, well, if you, if you think about the whole cycle, where you have subduction, uh, that's like throwing cold vegetables in boiling water. That's a cold slab, and that causes the mantle to cool because it's a heat sink. And that cooler mantle now is more dense, and it wants to sink. And so there's a feedback, a positive feedback. And so you generate a mantle flow, where the mantle tends to flow into areas of long-lived subduction. And if there's some traction between the mantle flow and the overriding plates, that can actually you know, cause the plates to tend to move into this area of, of, uh, of, of downwelling and long-lived subduction. And so uh, in 2013, I read this paper by uh, um, uh, the students and associates of, uh, of Rick O'Connell, Claudio Facenna, Thorsten Becker, uh, Clint Conrad, and this guy Hassan, who I don't know, published in Tectonics. And, and they said you can distinguish between two kinds of dynamics, one dominated by slab rollback and the other by slab suction. And slab rollback is where basically the plates are sinking into a passive medium. And slab suction is where you have this feedback between the subduction process and the, and the flow uh, uh, from, from convection that's guided by the thermal anomalies that the slabs impose. And I was thinking about this in the context of assembling uh, a, uh, a, a continent like Laurentia, and I thought, well, if slab rollback is really what is going on, if, 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 then it should be the lower plate, which is the plate around which the other continents accrete. Okay? So these sutures here you should decrease in age with distance from this center plate, the first plate, the origin, which should be a lower plate with respect to all the plates around it. Okay, and that would suggest slab rollback. Whereas if, if it was slab suction, the things would be, tend to be drawn in, and the, the founding uh, uh, continent uh, should be an upper plate. It should end up being the upper plate with respect to the adjacent continents, and the continents should get younger from the upper plate. Now, it turns out we know quite a bit about the subduction polarity of those suture zones in, uh, in Laurentia. This is Western Canada's aeromagnetic anomaly map. And the magmatic arcs are these red things here. They're red because these are what Japanese used to call ja uh, magnetite series granites, as opposed to ilmenite series granites. They have much higher magnetic susceptibility. 
So the dash lines, are, so, so that's an arc on the Hearn, and that's an, you know, so you can identify, and easy to get these uh, uh, subduction polarities. Incidentally, the subducting plate usually has these long wavelength uh, negative anomalies. <clears throat> So you can classify, according to the uh, arc subduction polarity, these Archean cratons. And it turns out there's one lower plate, which is a lower plate with respect to the ones around it, and one upper plate. And the others are intermediate, or middle plates, I call them. That is, their upper plate with respect. So the Hearn is a lower plate with respect to the ray, but the upper plate with respect to the superior. This one, the ray, is the upper plate with respect to everything. And the superior is the lower plate with respect to everything. So that means that we should just look and see what the ages of these sutures are relative to the superior and the ray, and see if we can discriminate between those two processes. So here's how we can uh, determine, and this is how we, these are old slides now. These are hand-colored uh, with Eagle Prismacolor double-sided Mylar slides. And uh, so this is the uh, passive margin to 4D transition in the Watme origin, which is up in the Northwestern Canadian Shield. And we've now uh, dated the rift to drift transition at 2014. The Shelp 4 deep transition, these are uranium lead tough ages from Sam Bowering. Uh, and this is 1882. So this passive margin lasted for 132 million years, almost indistinguishable from the average uh, duration of Phanerozoic collided uh, passive margins of 135 million years. And uh, so we know the collision age is 182. And then we can compare that with the with the transition from arc to a slab breakoff magnetism in the upper plate, if we want. So um, uh, the well-known artist Janine Schwartz will remember this is just uh, east of Eelcook Lake. And here's the shelf uh, uh, carbonates, and here's the overlying 40 classics. That's the transition. Yeah, the tough is right in there, not at this location. This is Steve Lucas, the young Steve Lucas. <laughs> So on the Slave province, we, uh, we have this ocean on the eastern margin of the Slave. That one closed at 1969. That's the uh, a tough at the at Shelf 4 deep transition on the east side of the Slave, 1882 for the, for the west side. And then there's a, a later terminal collision. So here are the ages as it now stands for, um, for the major sutures of Laurentia. And if you plot them in terms of distance from the superior, and the ray, to do our little test of this idea, uh, you can see in the superior there's no correlation at all. But in the ray, there's a pretty good correlation of, uh, of decreasing age with distance from the center of the ray craton. And so I think that uh, supports um, this model and not that model. And uh, I think what we uh, uh, would, uh, you know, uh, you should do here is to see if this kind of analysis uh, holds for Nuna as a whole. And Nuna is this uh, a supercontinent that formed around 1.8 and lasted until sometime around then. I called it Nuna uh, because Nuna is the Eskimo or Inuit name for the land. And these are people that live around the coast of the Arctic Ocean. And when they talk about the land, they're talking about all the land, all the land south of the Arctic Ocean. So I thought that was a good name for a supercontinent. OK, and uh, that last one, uh, the age and polarity between the Hearn and the Rain, uh, Ray Cratons, is thanks to Bob Berman and Sally Person. Uh, that's one of the, uh, uh, the now eroded magmatic arcs. Um, the Spy Who Loved Me, 007, jumped off, and when they filmed it, I uh, jumped right off there on Asgard and Baffin Island. Okay. And that's the dessert. <laughs> Questions about Nuna? <clears throat> yeah. Some have argued that uh, Nuna never broke up. The, the transition from Nuna to, to Rodinia was not one of rift to drift and then re-amalgamation. No. Um, and so it's, it's conspicuous to me that during the breakup of the Norland, um, and then also during the breakup of Rodinia, we have these glaciations, but we don't see that for Nuna. Yeah. Um, and perhaps 
um, I guess I would posit the reason for that is because there was yeah. a, a complete disamalgamation of, uh, or dis dis disintegration. We could play the same game. You know, Alex Detroit thought Pangea never existed, at least in the Paleozoic. I, I had never thought of that, actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, then you, you have, you have uh, removed and, uh, any possibility of explaining the Grenville origin and its uh, widely uh, strewn uh, correlatives, uh, which is known on e almost every craton except West Africa has this uh, 1050 to 1150. Uh, so I guess you, you could have, like, yeah. um, if you consider Africa and Eurasia as a supercontinent, yeah, um, megacon, megacon. Oh, Gondwana is megacon. Yeah. yeah, you didn't have to break up the megacon in, in order to yeah. form the Himalayas. Yeah, so there's been a very recent paper um, by uh, Richard Ernst and co-authors uh, proposing that Siberia and Laurentia have been together uh, from noon at, at least until a Rodinia breakup. I proposed in, in long ago uh, that Australia and Canada were fellow travelers, I, uh, <laughs> I think I called us. Uh, through that interval. Yeah, so I think some components, uh, you know, very likely in the same way that the, 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 all our, most of our continents today are composites of different uh, genealogies. Yeah, but whether, they, whether there was no, never really a reorganization uh, and that that might explain the absence of glaciation, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't considered that actually. Uh, so then uh, we would have to make the configuration of Nuna compatible with the configuration of Rodinia. I think as it stands now, they have some similarities, but there are a lot of differences. But I don't think either, I, I don't think the configuration of Rodinia, with all respect, I, th I think there's still, uh, there, there could still be radical changes uh, to the Rodinia configuration, although the Rodinia configuration as, as uh, Lee and company have done it. It stood up very well to paleoclimatic tests. Uh, your, your observation is not also when the break up completely every time, that's correct. But then what impact that is that on global or anything else? Yeah, that's the question you mentioned. Many, 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 many. I'll be at the front of the room for a while if anyone has any uh, <laughs> lots of blood in me in private. I think it's a really special seat because we have all the knowledge, all the, the insights, unique insights, and all the passion, or a lifetime passion in science. And uh, all the power is not going to be today, it's going to be done for Tuesday. And on Monday, lifetime, noon to one, there will be another seminar. The more more uh, the more detailed about the, the biological side of the, the, the global Earth. So anybody want to hear more about the, the biological evolution? And come come for the popular seminar on Monday. Yeah. If you have no more further questions, I'd like you to join me there. Thank you for this. <laughs>